that God wouldn't want them to have. Even though they have that desire, it doesn't mean that just because you desire something, lust for something, that you will get it. He said, you lust, and then the reality is, you do not have. You have this strong desire for something. And you desire it regularly and repeatedly. And the reality is, you don't have. And I think he's talking about in the context of personal relationship. You want something to go your way when it comes to your personal relationship. You have this desire, you have this lust, and you don't get your way. And James says, shockingly, so you commit murder. And some of you can't handle that, so you become angry. So you hate your brother or your sister in Christ. But it all starts with these unfulfilled desires, these pleasures that are waging war in our members. When they go unsatisfied, they can lead to other sins. And particularly, James says, they can lead to social sins. So you desire and you do not have. You commit murder. And then he goes on to say in the middle part of verse 2, you are envious. Now this word envious is related to the same word we saw about the sign of hellish wisdom. There it was translated in verse 14 of chapter 3 as jealousy. In chapter 3 verse 16 as jealousy. Same family of words. James says you have this zeal. And that's what the word jealousy and envy, at the root of it, that's what it means. Zeal. But it's zeal for the wrong things. It's zeal for what you want, not for what God wants. You're passionate. You're consumed to, to want something. But it's what you want. It's not necessarily what God wants. And because you have this zeal, because you're envious, James says just because you have that passion doesn't mean it's going to get fulfilled. And so he says you're envious, but you cannot obtain. See, the problem is when our, our desires, our pleasures, our sinful passion, when they're not fulfilled, they create all kinds of problems. We like to think it's the person. Our, the circumstance. But James is saying it's us. Many times the reason why we don't have good relationships is because our passions are warring in our members. Our passions are not fulfilled. We cannot obtain what we want. And so we're in a business meeting. Are we in a church meeting? And we want something. And nobody else wants it. And that passion and that zeal rises up. And you fight for it. You want it, etc. But you're not able to obtain. So what happens? James says, you fight and quarrel. That's what happens. That's why business meetings in the church can be a disaster. That's why pulpit committees can be a disaster. Because people are telling you what they want, what they're passionate about. And many times what people are passionate about has nothing to do with what God is passionate about. And, and so when you get all these passions operating, what happens? There's fights. There's conflicts. That's why you know, when you say to a congregate, what do you want? It doesn't matter what you want. It's all about what does God want. I mean, pastoring is almost like being the president. The president, he might get 48% of the votes, and he gets the position. Well, hello, 52% of the people are already against you. I don't know about you, that doesn't sound too encouraging to me. But that can happen in churches. Because somebody says, I want a young pastor. Somebody else, I want an old pastor. Somebody says, I want a good-looking pastor. Somebody else says, I want an ugly one. 
And what happens? You got these passions, these desires. You're zealous for things. And it can wreak havoc in the church. These words hit me like a bombshell almost 20 years ago when I resigned from a church in Denver. I let the church know who I thought should be the next pastor. And this passage just cut me up. I had to repent. Because all I was doing was expressing my passion, my zeal, my desire. I hadn't consulted God. I hadn't prayed to God. I was just trying to make a situation better. And that can happen so easy. <clears throat> And so when we have our different committees, our different boards, it's not about what I want and what you want. It's about what does Christ want? What honors the Lord Jesus Christ? So James says, you're envious. You have this burning passion. But it's not a passion for the right things. And you're not able to obtain. So what do you do? You fight and you quarrel. And so in the, minds of, in the mind of James, worldliness in the church looks like God's people fighting with each other, warring with each other, at strife with each other, battling each other, and not getting along with each other. And if you are here at Fairview, and there's just one person that you don't have the right kind of relationship with. You better be careful that the reason why is not because you're worldly. It's not because you possess and given in to that internal sign of warring pleasures. It's not because you're manifesting the external sign. You need to make sure that it's not a result of unfulfilled desires. So James talks about the internal sign. He also talks about the external sign. But he concludes when he talks about the spiritual sign. He says at the end of verse 2, you do not have, and that's the reality, you do not have. He says, uh, you lust, but you do not have. You're envious, but you cannot obtain. So James now says, you do not have. Why? Because you do not ask. And he's saying that the spiritual sign of worldliness is a defective prayer life. When your prayer life is defective, that is an indication that you, as a Christian, are worldly. Because a defective prayer life, in essence, says, I'm not praying, I'm not crying out to God like I should. And James just comes out. And he says, you want to know why you don't have? Because you don't ask. You don't take it to God in prayer. And so he's saying a mark of a defective prayer life is no prayer. No prayer, our little prayer, is a mark of a defective prayer life. Now, now you can ignore this. You can come up with all the reasons that you want. But James is saying that if your prayer life is defective, if it's marked by no prayer, that in essence, you're worldly. If you are a genuine Christian, you're worldly. Because no prayer, our little prayer, is what characterizes unsaved people. Unsaved people don't pray unless they're really, really desperate. They might get somebody to pray or utter a prayer. Because the reason why they don't pray, they don't believe that they need God's help. You see, prayer, simply put, is an expression of your dependency upon God. People who pray are dependent upon God. 
They understand and they realize that they cannot make it in life without the enablement, without the help of God. And so they cry out to him continually and repeatedly and ask God to work and to help and to undergird and to strengthen. People who don't pray, whether they're cognizant of it or not, whether they're aware of it or not, people who don't pray are in essence saying, I can do it on my own. I don't need the help of Almighty God. I can do it in my own strength, I can do it in my own ability. I don't need God's help. And that's what the world says day in and day out. I'm going to do it my way. And James is saying to his reader, you don't have. And he said, I'm just going to cut to the chase because you don't ask, you don't pray. And he anticipates the fact that some would object and say, oh, James, that's not me. I pray, James. I pray. And so James says that not only is uh, no prayer a mark of defective prayer, but also selfish prayer is a mark of defective prayer. And so he goes from no prayer to selfish prayer in verse 3. He anticipates those that are going to say, James, I pray. I bow my head before I eat the food. I say, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul. To... I do pray, James. James, I prayed about this. I prayed about that. I prayed about a better job. I prayed about living in a better place. James, I pray. And James says in verse 3, you ask. He says, I'll admit. You do ask. He says, you 